villain's got the girl and his fingers on the trigger. Voldemort, Sauron, and Vader reign. It's gone to penalties. Against the Germans again. It's a terrible feeling when hope is erased, faith misplaced, virtue defaced, gloom embraced, reputation replaced with the taste of disgrace. When you've pushed every door and it's been slammed in your face, when you realise you're third in a two-horse race. So come sit with me on Golgotha's slopes. See human history at its lowest ebb. See the forces of goodness and grace on the ropes. Evil had spoken, last rites read. In a phony gown and thorny crown, he's mocked and knocked and shamed. As he staggers down through an angry town, they spit and hit and hate. Hands that forged galaxies and flung starry trails are pierced and punctured by merciless nails. His body succumbing to brutal infliction. These are the horrors of crucifixion. And as dice are tossed, hope is lost. Desolate disciples count the cost. King of the Jews, his headrest embossed, a criminal's killing on Calvary's cross. And as last words cut through foul-smelling air, the whole of the cosmos cries out in despair, it is finished. It's over. But then dawn breaks on Easter day, Darkness quakes as shadows give way to the light. See, resurrection's the plan, it's why God sent him. And the comeback's on, there's a change of momentum. The powers of damnation in previous jubilation have been hushed and crushed by the Lord of creation. See, he takes the hit, stands where we should have stood. And that's why we call Friday good. And he's back with life and with us and blessed. And that's why we can know it a Sunday best. So to the 4 nil down, to the backs against the wall, listen to his rallying resurgent call. And to those up against it in brokenness and pain, Easter's story roars, we go again. So thine be the glory, death's lost its sting. Here's to Jesus, the comeback king. Good morning, Port Stewart Baptist. Great to have you here this morning. Great to have so many folk visiting with us as well. Christ is risen. He is risen. I am not convinced by that at all. Christ is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed, and that's why we fill the car park and the building, and we gather to sing our worship to a risen King. I want to read a short reflection to stir our hearts as we come to worship. It says, Jesus knew he was going to die. And he knew that he wouldn't stay dead. Friday may have been dark and sad. Saturday, stone cold with silence. But Sunday, the third day, was not just another day or another week. It was another age. A new time had begun. The biggest story of God's redemption had turned a page. The world would never be the same again. At the break of day, Mary and a group of women went to that tomb. They thought they would find there Jesus and put perfume on, perfume on his dead body. But what they found instead was a complete surprise. On the outside of the tomb, the stone was rolled away. On the inside lay the folded grave clothes. Then the women wondered, what did this mean? But before they could think very long, two angels as bright as the sun stood before them. Why do you seek the living among the dead, they asked. Jesus is not here. He's risen, just as he said he would. Why don't we stand together? We come to worship this risen King who is true to his word, who has defeated death and sin and hell. And so we gather as a risen people this morning and sing our songs of victory in him. Let's worship together.
today as it was all those years ago. The voice that spans the years speaks and whispers to our heart. And we rejoice today that he is risen, that we can stand in the truth of your resurrection, that we can know that peace that your voice brings, that endless, unfailing love, that healing touch. Praise you, King Jesus. May your name be glorified today and all our days. Please be seated. There's no better sound than to hear the Lord's people sing in unison together. Thank you for that. Thank you to the band. Just want to add to Johnny's welcome. Welcome to those also watching online and to those um, who are in our overflow spaces. A special welcome to you guys. Hope you feel part of our, our service here this morning. We're going to join by reading a psalm together, a response of psalm, Psalm 65. I will read the words in white and you will follow the words in yellow. A psalm of hope, a psalm of joy. So let's read it with vigor as we've just been as we've just been singing. So let's read together Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer to you is this on screen. I printed off the wrong psalm, so use this one here. <laughs> I love you, brother. It's it's April Fool's Day, isn't it? Partnership. It's April Fool's Day. I'm the fool. Okay. I was like, is everyone asleep? So stick with the screen. Is that what I'm doing? Yeah? Okay. I need a coffee. <laughs> okay. Apologies about that. You're very welcome here this morning. Let's join this psalm together. I'll read in the white and you will follow suit in the yellow. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another, God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup you hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to show, or let the Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. Amen. Well done. We're going to pray now. I'm going to lead us in a prayer of intercession. And uh, just with times of silence in this prayer, if you feel you want to bring things to the Lord, Feel free to do so in silence. Let's pray. We give you thanks for your love, your grace, and your power on this resurrection morning. We thank you for the many friends and loved ones and visitors who gather here with us today. Today, God, we gather to remember and to celebrate. We remember Jesus who healed the sick and raised the dead. We remember Jesus who died in our place. But today, Almighty God, we celebrate. We celebrate the fact that death could not hold Jesus in the grave. We celebrate that not even death is able to separate us from the love of God. We celebrate new life that we have in Christ. And we celebrate the assurance that we have eternal life. O oh God, in this Easter morning, we pray for those who are grieving darkness and loss before the tomb of Jesus, as Mary did long ago. Like her, all they have seen before them is emptiness. They have run out of places where hope can be found for themselves or for those they love. As Mary stood weeping in the dawning light, she looked into that dark and empty tomb, one 
last time. And there she found new hope for herself and for us, that no matter how hopeless the world may seem, that tomb is God's promise, that in each ending there is a new beginning and new life. A promise that God will never forget us. A promise that God will never leave us or forsake us. A promise that God's hope is and always will be living within us and will never die. O God, you are with us in the midst of every one of the fears and tribulations we face in the present. Job loss, illness, isolation, hunger, abuse, uncertainty, or the loss of the ones close. And in our silence just now, we lift those needs before you. God, you are the answer. Help us, O Lord, to live as you desire, to live with hope and proclaiming this knowledge, this certainty that you are here, working in and through us, and that not even death and darkness can stop your word or prevent us from finding new life, joy, peace, and grace. Father, we remember our missionaries this morning and our missionary partners. Bless them as they proclaim the resurrection power of Jesus today and every day. We pray for Johnny as he brings your word to us later. Fill him, equip him, and use him. And above all, O Lord, be glorified on this day. Amen. as we continue in worship.
Jesus is. He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the
sing hallelujah. When the soul of God, we sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. And then the soul of God, we sing For the past bunch of months, we've been in the book of Revelation doing a tour of that book, a picture gallery that shows us all these amazing images of the risen Lord Jesus. I'm just going to ask my friends, the McCooks, to come, and they're going to lead us in our scripture reading from the final chapter of that book, Revelation 22. Thanks, guys. The river of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Jesus is coming. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers, the prophets, and of all who keep the words of this book, worship God. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon. 
I will bring my rewards with me to give to each one according to what he has done. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Happy are those who wash their robes clean and so have the right to eat from the fruit from the tree of life and to go through the gates into the city. But outside the city are the perverts and those who practice magic, the immoral and the murderers, those who worship idols and those who are liars both in words and deeds. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to announce these things to you in the churches. I am descended from the family of David. I am the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Everyone who hears this must also say, come. Come, whoever is thirsty, accept the water of life as a gift, whoever wants it. Conclusion. I, John, solemnly warn everyone who hears the prophetic words of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to his punishment and the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes anything away from the prophetic words of this book, God will take away from him his share of the fruit of the tree of life and of the holy city, which are described in this book. He who gives his testimony to all this says, yes, indeed, I am coming soon. So be it, come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. part of our worship this morning and um, we are now going to wait upon you for your offering if you just remain in your seats thank you Why don't we still our hearts together in prayer? Let's all pray together. Father, we say to you that we just prize moments of silence and reflection in just the busyness of this day. We know this is a day of great celebration, and we thank you for that. I was reflecting this week. Very rarely do I step out of this building and I'm not buffeted by the wind. That's just our location. But how we pray this morning that the mighty wind of God, the Holy Spirit, would be present within this building, that you would move amongst us, and that you would take this word that you've breathed out, and that you would make it real in our hearts and our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
good number of years ago now, uh, I was sitting in our house and I heard a great yell uh, coming from the other end of the house. It's not a big house. Uh, and one of our kids was protesting that they didn't want to go to a certain place. Please don't let us go there, please. And I wondered where they were talking about. They were, in fact, talking about Ikea, because it was their sense that when you went to Ikea, you could just never find your way out of that place. And I know there are some here in our church family this morning who have maybe felt that way about the book of Revelation. Please don't go there again. We're never going to get out of this thing. And yet here we are today in the final chapter of this great book of Revelation. You'll want to keep it open before you. I try to stick to the text as much as possible. As I've said, we've considered the book of Revelation uh, to be a bit like a picture gallery. The Apostle John has been giving us a tour here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he's been laying before us a whole series of portraits of the Lord Jesus. Some of them have been so warm and comforting. We've experienced Jesus, the pastor who walks amongst his people seeking to bless them, instruct them. We've seen a glimpse of Jesus, the Lamb, breaking the seals of history, opening the scrolls and unfurling the saving plan of God. We've seen lately a beautiful portrait of Jesus, the bridegroom, how he covenants to adorn his beloved people, his church, to clothe her in fine linen and dwell with her in unbroken unity for all eternity. But some of the portraits have been a wee bit difficult, maybe hard for us to come to terms with. We've also seen images of Jesus, the judge, pouring out bowls of wrath on the earth. Jesus, the sovereign, bringing plagues and days of terrible suffering like those in the days of Pharaoh, or Jesus the warrior slaying his enemies and excluding from heaven all those who are hard and unbelieving of heart and who refuse to be conquered by his saving love. Here in Revelation 22, we find our final portrait of the Lord Jesus. It's found in verse 16. It's that he is the bright and morning star. But you'll notice that surrounding this final portrait of Jesus, the morning star, is some very familiar framing, some very familiar themes that we've come upon again and again in this study of the book. First of all, I want to point you to the promise of heaven. That's what we're shown in the first five verses of the chapter. You'll notice straight away some features or characteristics of heaven that we've heard of before. First of all, in verse 3, we're told that in this place there will be no sin nor anything accursed. That is, of course, because God has already dealt with sin. He's already dealt with all his enemies. They've been swallowed up in the lake of fire in in chapter 20. It's also because only those who enter heaven are, are those who are saved through his sacrifice on the cross. Remember, on the cross, he was made accursed for us. Not only this, verse 3, we're reminded that at the center of all the proceedings in the new heavens and earth will be the Lamb. He will be the focal point of all the worship. We've heard that before as well. It shouldn't surprise us. Of course, that's right, isn't it? That the Lamb should be at the center, that He should get all the glory. After all, God has acted in this great conspiracy of grace to redeem a lost and broken world. How? By slaying His Son as a sacrificial Lamb. Verse 4, we're reminded of that intimate face-to-face encounter that we will have with God in the final days, that, that we will be His, that He will be ours, that His very name will be imprinted upon our foreheads as a proof that we are purchased by Him, never to be lost or separated from Him again. And then in verse 5, another familiar image just from Friday night, we discovered that there'll be no need of any light in the new heavens and earth. Why? Because the brightness and the brilliance and the glory of God will be present. He will be warming our hearts, guiding our steps, ordering all our days. So many familiar themes here of the new heavens And I believe it's good for us as God's people to be reminded of these things because we need to be weaned off the world, don't we? We need to be reminded again and again that our hope is not here, 
It's not now. It's in what's yet to come. It's in this glorious inheritance that we have in the risen and reigning Lord Jesus. But what is new here in this chapter concerning the promise of heaven is the seeming collision of metaphors. You, you see it there in verses 1 and 2. The images of heaven as a, a new garden of Eden appear to be colliding with these images of a, a new Jerusalem. They're, they're merging together. And so we find John describes a, a river running down through the middle of the streets, the tree of life found on either side of that river. It yields its fruit an exorbitant rate of growth, providing healing for the nations. Why is this so important or significant for us to notice? Well, in a sense, of course, we're being reminded here that this chapter is not just the end of the book of Revelation, it's the end of the Bible narrative. And here, we're really being taken back to the start, to, to Genesis, where Adam and Eve, remember, were excluded from the tree of life after their sinful rebellion against God. Our first parents thrown out of the garden in sin and in death. Those things became the norm. But now here in Revelation 22, we're, we're told that right of access to God has opened up. His blessings have been restored. And what was paradise lost in Genesis 3 is now paradise regained in Revelation 22. In fact, the scene before us is possibly, we might say, even better than Eden itself. John tells us here that there's not just one tree of life, there's a whole grove of trees lining the riverbanks, producing a miraculous month-by-month -month bumper crop, bearing these leaves of incredible healing powers that can reconcile and soothe all the hurts and all the harms of all the people and all the nations. Surely that's a good image for us to consider on a day like today. All you need to do is turn on the news and you'll see it everywhere. There's corruption, there's strife, there's sin, there's selfishness and suffering and brokenness and, and devastation, people turning from God, people turning from one another. And yet John tells us here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that in heaven, we find all the barriers removed, the barrier between us and God, the, the barriers between one another, promises of feeding and healing and a great unifying of, of all people. And yet I want you to notice, how does this happen? How do these trees and their fruit and their leaves have the power to do so much good, to affect so much change, to, to right so many wrongs and produce so much blessing? Well, it's because we're told they are planted alongside the river. In other words, their roots go deep. They go deep into a vast, boundless, life-giving supply. And where does that supply come from? Where we're told the river flows forth from the throne of God and the Lamb. Friends, this is massively important. I need us to understand what John is saying here. Paradise is only regained, and the riches of the tree of life are only ever experienced and enjoyed by sinners like you and I in heaven because of the Lamb, because He came down from His throne, and because He bore another tree entirely a tree on a hill outside the city wall, a tree of shame. The Bible said that Jesus was made a sin-bearing substitute for us, made a curse for us, cut off, beaten, and broken. This is the central message of the Bible. And this is what John is showing us here. It is only through the riches of God's grace that flowed us from Calvary that sinners like you and I will ever know the happiness and the healing of heaven. Friends, heaven is only possible 
because Christ went through hell for you and I. James Montgomery Boyce says in his, his commentary, he says, the church often suffers attempts to marginalize the theme of the cross and its blood and its sacrifice. It seems like sheer barbarism to unbelievers. But in truth, the barbarism is our sin and the violence of God's wrath against that sin. It is the severity of our sin and the hell it deserves in the first place. At the heart of the gospel is the blood of Christ shed and the body of Christ broken. And it is only when we come to the cross by repentance and faith that we find cleansing from sin and can enter the blessing of heaven. Folks, please understand that today. No Savior on the cross, and none of us sinners will inherit any of this. It's all because of Jesus. What do we sing so often? There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. This is what he's done. And this is what we celebrate this morning, isn't it? But there's a second major theme, a second kind of piece of the frame around this portrait of Jesus that we've got to consider here. John not only reminds us that the promise of heaven is for those who come by way of the cross, but he also reminds us that the prospect of judgment is the reality for those who don't, verses 6 through 15. Again, this is a well-rehearsed theme in the book of Revelation, the theme of judgment. Verse 7, Jesus declares his imminent return and the need to obey and, and to put trust in him and, and to be faithful to his word and, and to be found ready. Then verses 8 and 9, we find John falling before the angel mistakenly. He's, he's worshiping him, and yet he's rebuked. This is a reminder to all of us that First and foremost, God's Word instructs us that we need to give all the honor and all the glory to Him, not to created things. If we are to be doers of the Word, then we need to put Him first in our lives. And yet, what about those who don't do that? What about those who reject the Word? and who push God to, to the periphery, who, who despise Him in their actions and in their inaction, who exchange the glory of God for another, who waste their lives in disobedience. Well, John is told, is he not, verse 10, that he needs to trust God. He needs to trust God's perfect timing. Verse 12, he needs to trust God's perfect justice. He will repay each one for what he has done. This is a reminder to John and a reminder, I think, to you and I that it's not our job to play God. It's not our job to be judge and jury. Rather, God is calling John here to be faithful. Be faithful to the word entrusted to you. Cling to that word and testify to that word. I believe that the same challenge rings true to you and I as the church of Jesus Christ today. We are those called to cling to the Word of God and to share the Word of God with others. And what is that Word? Well, the Word is the gospel. The Word is the promise of sin forgiven and conscience cleansed and death defeated. And yes, life, life without end. Verse 14, it's the promise of having our robes washed white. It's the promise of being given the right to enter the new heavens through the city gates. Did you notice here the contrast between those who enter heaven, verse 14, and yet there are those who are excluded and eternally lost, verse 15. We read such things soberly, don't we? Certainly not smugly. You'll notice that this latter group is described as dogs, that's not a complimentary saying. In ancient times, dogs were despised creatures who scavenged in the dumps outside the city. And so it is for all those who love and practice falsehood 
says the Scriptures. We've come across that term before, haven't we? I believe we need to bear in mind here that the list of sins John includes here and and elsewhere in in this book of Revelation is not necessarily prescriptive or, or exhaustive. Rather, these are mere examples, examples of living in a way that is false, in a way that is inauthentic. Instead, the living God calls us to do what is true, and and what is true? Well, according to the Bible, the truest thing that you or I could ever do is repent of our sin, repent of our disobedience, and come to the Lord Jesus and trust in Him for salvation. Those who do that, who do what is true, who come by the way of the cross, don't need to figure out a way into heaven. We don't need to construct a ladder of good works. We don't need to try and scale the city walls or hoist ourselves up by sheer strength of will, as if any of those things was possible. Rather, we're assured here, aren't we? Verse 14, those who trust in the Son will walk through the gates into that heavenly city. Why? because that is their right. How can that be? How can sinners like you and I, messed up people, broken people, how can we have the right of heaven? Because of Jesus. Because Jesus is the fountain who was opened up to cleanse us. Jesus is the gate who was opened up that we might enter in and be saved. Finally, we arrive at the portrait itself, verse 16. It's actually a self-portrait. Here Jesus is giving testimony through the angels to John, and now he steps forward himself. And he steps forward that he might have the final word in this book of Scripture. And he gives us not just one image, but really two images joined together that reflect to us the reality of his saving person and work. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root, descendant of David, the bright morning star. Here, Jesus, in essence, is showing that he is the fulfillment of two Old Testament promises. Of course, he's the the fulfillment of, of all Old Testament promises. But the first promise he alludes to when he speaks about being the root or or descendant of David is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah 11, God is speaking to Israel in the midst of very dark and difficult days. In fact, at that stage in the story, Israel has been laid bare in their sin. They've been cut down in their pride and their idolatry, chastened and disciplined by God. In fact, the judgment of God had been so severe upon them that the prophet says it's like looking out at a vast field of tree stumps. There's no sign of life, no sign of goodness, no hope of a future. Everything fell to the ground. There seems little prospect of renewal or restoration. That must have been hard for the prophet Isaiah to look at. How could this be the chosen people of God? The people from whom came Moses or David? It seemed that the glory days were gone. And yet the core message of Isaiah 11 of that word of prophecy is this, that in the midst of judgment, God remembers mercy into the seemingly impossible situation, God, who is still sovereign and still good, breaks through. You see, God is not done with His people, though He should be, He could be, but He has a plan. His plan is to raise up a ruler, not an arrogant ruler, not a self-serving ruler like those of the nations, but a true king, a, a perfect king, one whose character will be exemplary, 
One whose reign will be eternal. One whose reach and influence will extend to the furthest ends of the globe. One who would bring and be the very manifestation of God himself. Greater than David. Of course, we're talking about the Lord Jesus. But why does Jesus bother to hearken back to some promise in Isaiah? Surely that kind of promise was fulfilled in his first coming, in his, in his incarnation. Why does he use this promise here at the end of the close of Revelation? Well, the beauty of that prophecy is that it not only pictures a, a kind of revitalized Israel, but more than that, it shows us a reordered world. The prophet speaks of the wolf and the lamb, the lion and the fattened calf lying down together, and children playing by the pit of the cobra. Yet no harm befalls any of them. Why? Because the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Ray Ortland explains, there have been struggles and convulsions in the creation ever since God first cursed the ground in Eden. Nature is violent, thrashing about in self-injury, groaning because nobody enjoys dying, not even animals. But here Jesus reminds us that all the agony of the ages will not be in vain. This present age of weary longing will one day be over, and newness and life will spring forth for every living creature. That's our hope this morning, isn't it, on this Resurrection Sunday? We believe in restoration. We believe in a, a great reordering, a great newness of things that is coming, and the resurrection of Jesus is simply the sneak preview. It's the first fruits. I'm reminded of that great story written by C.S. Lewis, the Lion, the, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You maybe recall that section in the story where the world is in a perpetual state of cold. Always winter and never Christmas. But then, of course, Aslan, that great king who died, rose again, a, a picture of the Lord Jesus. And what happens? The ice begins to melt. The flowers begin to bloom. The trees turn green, and an eternal spring is birthed into existence. This is what Jesus is reminded us of here in Revelation 22. He is the root and descendant of Jesus. In other words, he is the sovereign over all. It is through him and because of him that one day soon all the hostilities will end. A new harmony will exist. Paradise will be regained. Decay will give way to glory. Of course, nobody here needs me to remind them that we're not there yet. This world we're living in is not a utopia, is it? We're not about to drop the kids off at the zoo and let them play in the snake pit, although sometimes we're tempted to. But the sure and certain hope of what Jesus promises here, I think, is very real and very significant in a pastoral sense. You see, Jesus, in these closing verses of the entire Bible, is at pain to remind us of something. He's reminding us that amidst our present brokenness, amidst all the heartache and disappointment, which is our daily experience, a new day is coming. A better day is coming a newness which we have not even begun to wrap our heads around. You see, ultimately, church, ultimately, not one single inch of the created order will escape the touch of His restorative grace. King Jesus, the long-awaited shoot, will not only redeem the souls of sinful humanity, He will reverse and heal the corruption of our sin-infected world. Isn't that good news? I believe it is. Surely, when you think about it, Jesus preaches an audacious gospel, doesn't he? 
he closes this book of Scripture. But he wants us to understand this is not some pie-in-the-sky picture or, or prophecy. If anything, the first fruits of this new world order were witnessed that first Easter morning. When the risen Lord Jesus stepped out of the tomb, he was giving us a preview of this of the immortal newness, which will one day be an inescapable reality. And I can't wait, can you? But with this self-portrait, Jesus wants to assure us, not only does he usher in a new world order, but he ushers in a brand new eternal day. Look at what he says. He says, yes, I'm the root and descendant of David, but more than that, I am the bright morning star. This is a reference spoken about a prophecy from the prophet Balaam back in the book of Numbers. He was being used as a mouthpiece of God back then, and this is what he says, a star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise up out of Israel. The point of the message was a new king was coming. A new star was rising in the dark skies of human history. A new age of peace would soon be ushered in. Donald Gray Barnhouse explains, in the ancient world, stars were the heavenly timepieces by which the shepherd told the different seasons of the year, determined the different watches of the night. And it was the morning star which heralded the sunrise and the breaking of a brand new day. In this respect, then, we should understand that here Jesus is speaking to us as the sheep of his pasture, those whom he's brought in from wandering. And our shepherd Savior is reminding us, he's assuring us, the night will soon be over. Soon the many dangers and disappointments that we presently experience and endure, these things will be gone. And a glorious new day will be ushered in. When I think of that new day, I think of something I did in my former life. I was a history teacher, and I was teaching a course on American history, and we lived in the city of Philadelphia where a lot of history took place. And I think of a story in particular of a convention that took place there in the 1700s. And one of the famous people at that convention was a man named Benjamin Franklin. And this is what he writes in his diary the day that they signed the Constitution that would form the, the, the basis of that new nation. He says, whilst the members were signing the Constitution, Dr. Franklin, looking towards the president's chair, at the back of which a rising sun happened to be painted, observed to a few members there that the painters had obviously found it difficult to distinguish in their art a rising sun from a setting sun. I have often, he said, in the course of these sessions, looked at that sun on the chair without being able to tell, is it rising or is it setting? But now at length, writes Franklin, I have the happiness to know it is a rising and not a setting sun. What's the point Franklin was making in a poetic way? What he's trying to say is that for the United States at that time, after much struggle, after much hardship, a new age had begun. A new day pregnant with the promises of life and liberty and happiness. This is the exact same point being made by Jesus here in Revelation 22. He calls himself the bright and morning star. And as he does so, he's encouraging us. You see, it's perfectly possible as we've read this book of Revelation and all its talk of wrath and judgment and torment and, and plague and suffering, it's possible that we've concluded that's the end of things. There's no hope. And yet the reality is there's great hope. You see, friends, for those who trust in Christ, the sun is not setting. It's rising. Jesus says, don't give way to doubt or, or despair. Yes, it's true. In the, in the end days, things will be hard. There will be persecution. There will be strife. 
There will certainly be suffering and torment and, and judgment for those who are the enemies of God. And yet, be sure, the sun will rise. Jesus, the bright and morning star, will usher in a new, a, a glorious day. The question is, are you going to be part of it? Do you believe on him? Will you believe on him before it's too late and the sun sets on the day of grace and rises again to the day of his reign? That's really the crux of the matter, isn't it? It strikes me that I wouldn't be a very loving pastor and we wouldn't be much of a church if we didn't ask that question. Really, this is the question that pervades the whole of this book. In fact, in a beautiful note, I want to finish by pointing you to verse 17. Look at Jesus. He grabs one more opportunity, and what does he do? He invites sinners to come to him. He calls those who are thirsty for what is real and what is true to turn away from broken cisterns. Turn away from the things that can't satisfy you, that can't sustain you, that will never save you, and do what? Come and drink. Come and drink of him. He is the well of salvation. Come and drink without any price. Why? Because the price has been paid on Calvary. Oh, how I love the relentless earnestness of Jesus here, don't you? Jesus takes every single opportunity to cry out to sinners like you and I. Come, come, come and live. Come and drink. Come and enter this new and glorious day. Have you come? Will you come? If you have, then you can approach the day of his appearing with expectation. Jesus says, surely I am coming. And all who are his people cry, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Let's pray together, shall we? The hymn writer writes, Come to the river that flows through the city, forth from the throne of the Father and Son. Jesus, the Savior, says, Come, drink deeply. Drink from the pure, inexhaustible one. Father, how we thank you for your life-giving word. We thank you for how it describes in detail the hope of heaven and the joy of all that awaits us there in the midst of the one who is the bright morning star. Oh Lord, if there are any here today who have not looked to that star, who have not yet come to the Lord Jesus in repentance and faith, how we pray that today would be their resurrection day and that they would know no peace until they come to him, the source of peace. And upon your own who love you, though often so imperfectly, how we pray, would you revive our hearts this resurrection day? And would you strengthen our resolve to go out into the world, go out into the mess and the brokenness as messengers of hope, pointing to Jesus, pointing to the revelation of his truth, pointing others to the reality that he still raises the dead. For we pray these things in the name of him who was and who is and who is yet to come in glory. Amen. Let's stand together.
people to sing of the completion of Christ's work on Calvary, that he didn't end the story there, but he rose again, and he's soon to return, and we will dwell with him in glory. I pray that you know the reality of that hope, that you have that assurance of heaven this morning. I want to encourage you, if God's been prompting you through something we've sung, something you've heard, folk will be available for prayer here at the front this morning. If you've not yet lost your voice, I nearly have. This is the third service today. We have another service tonight at 6.30, and it's our Easter hymn sing. Our friend Jonathan Ray and some of the folk from New Irish Arts are going to be here and lead us in a whole evening of just singing our hearts out to the Lord, and you'd be warmly welcome there tonight. Let me just part us with a blessing. And now may the God of all mercy who has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, fill you now with his resurrection spirit that you might go and tell a dying world about the life-giving Savior. God bless you, and happy Christmas. Happy Christmas, happy Easter. <laughs> Got you.